If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet. We are back. I believe this is number seven. We've got uh, Brigadier General Bowman here with us. I understand he's sometimes named, uh, called Boris, but that's not for you. You will tell him, call him General <laughs> or Sir. No. That's what you will do. And uh, I had a request here from someone. He asked me to say hello to an uncle of him in New Zealand. He's called uh, Louis Topfiff, which I understand is a South African research as well, a veteran. So you are very welcome here. Thank you for watching our show. We are grateful for you, every one of you as well. And now, we, today we want to talk about the Tron Combat School. Um, I thought it was a battle school, but the general has, has told me it's not. So, sir, very welcome. Can you tell me why is it not a battle school? And if we talk about a battle school, we actually mean the Atla. I'm sure we'll get to it at some stage, but can you just give us a brief uh, background here? Fine. Yeah. Fine. The, the uh, Donitron Combat School was established uh, in the early 70s in Kimberley. And that was to train the commandos, citizen force and permanent force with respect to counterinsurgency operations. Not far from Kimberley at Luatla is the Army Battle School where they train conventional forces. So uh, the, the Battle School at, at Luatla uh, has got a very big training area. And that's where all the tanks and artillery and the infantry and, and all the other services combine together in military exercises. And they also conduct courses for citizen force and permanent force members to qualify them as captains, majors, and, and further, further up. And the Donitron Combat School, the topic of the moment, is in Kimberley, and uh, it's there to train counterinsurgency all the various uh, branches. First of all, why Dani Tron Combat School? Dani Tron, was, in my opinion, was the first Reiki in South Africa in our modern, modern situation. He was a person who was born in Tolba, in the Boerland. He studied law at Cambridge. And while at Cambridge, he took the trains to Salisbury, where the Salisbury Plains are, where the British forces prepared for war against South Africa. And he sat on those planes and he made notes. And uh, he looked at the tactics that these people are going to do in South Africa, that they're going to execute. He looked at the weaponry and all these things. And he also went to Southampton the port of Southampton, where I saw how the British conditioned the horses on ships to come to South Africa and what they did there. And he came to South Africa, came back to South Africa before the declaration of, of the Second uh, anglo Boer War. And he gave this information to President Paul Creer and President Stein. And of course, you know what? They didn't believe him. They said, it's nonsense. It's not possible. The rest is history. Now, this guy, during the anglo Boer War, he had a core of men. They first started uh, on railway lines with bicycles, and then with bicycles, and then horseback. They found horseback was better. He had a group um, ranging from 12 to uh, about 20. Now, the one person in his group was Jack Hinden. He was uh, an Irishman. And the other guy was Hendy Schlechtkamp. He was a Dutch. So it was, a, I don't want to use the word foreign legion. And they, they caused a lot of problems for the British. Uh, he mostly fought under General De Wet. And uh, at Paarenberg, when uh, General Pitcairn here was besieged by the British, he moved through those lines and, and told uh, General Pitcairn mount your men, Get the woman and the oxen and the wagons. I can lead you out of here. The old man didn't want to do that, and they were all captured. This is the caliber of the man, Danny Tron. 
Uh, after uh, the unit left in 1989, the name was carried over to the Intelligence uh, Force Training School in Potchestro. And the function was uh, also given back to infantry school. So it was the second time in my career that a, a function went over to infantry school, also my alma mater. Now, uh, with your permission, I was at the Donitron Combat School in, in, in two capacities. Uh, and I think we must cover both of them because the, uh, the syllabus and the function of the unit are precisely the same. And I'll emphasize a few, few differences. The first uh, period I want to discuss with you is from 1977 to 1997. I was transferred from the infantry school as a major there, and I started at the counterinsurgency wing, uh, where we trained uh, commando units from sergeant up to sergeant major, and then from lieutenant up to lieutenant colonel in the commando organization. Uh, secondly, we also trained citizen force uh, soldiers in the same rank uh, bracket that I've mentioned, as well as the permanent force officers. Once they were finished at Luatla with their training courses and their promotion courses, they came to us for a period of six weeks and we trained them in counterinsurgency. Next to the Donitron Combat School is a, a very big training area at Spitzdrup. Uh, and at present, there's a lot of field fires in the Kimberley and Spitzdrup area. And if we were there, we would have been firefighters. That's just, just on the situation of where it is located. The officer's mess was an old hotel on the road to Markersfontein and it was named after Jack Hinden, this second in command of, of Danny Tron a very nice old building and very nicely uh, renovated. And it was really a pleasure to have functions there and, and to stay there. My, uh, the officer's commanding house was right opposite Jack Inman's uh, officer's mess. There was a tram from the old days that were there. And uh, over weekends, it looked like a hostel because all the kids wanted to come play there with our kids because it was open spaces and things like that. I really appreciated that. Kimberly is the town in South Africa that were the most positive towards soldiers. We got there and they were really very friendly with us. They invited us to, the, as a major, I was on the in, invitation list of the mayoral functions. They didn't uh, only get the big weeks, Our younger guys were also invited and that was a, a very good schooling. Uh, to go there. The MOF organization was very positive towards the soldiers, as well as the uh, South African Legion. And then, of course, the Air Force uh, uh, Legion was also there. And uh, it was very nice to meet all these people. And as I said, it was an environment very positive towards soldiers and what we were doing. Um, it was a privilege to deal with the leader group of our citizen force, permanent, permanent force, and, and our commander members. And it was an experience to get the cream from all over the country. And you, I met some wonderful people in that situation. In 1976, uh, we were told to take a group of uh, citizen force, permanent force, and even, uh, uh, and especially commando unit commanders up to the operational area. In this group, the one person, he was a major, Johan Marais, he passed away quite a while ago, was uh, one of my teachers in primary school. So here I am as a major, and I meet this major who was my teacher, but he was a very positive guy in rugby and, and all these things. He remembered me and uh, obviously he got presidential treatment. That's, that's no, but, but he was a good guy. And I remember from school days that he was very involved in the commando organization. The second one was one of my lecturers at the military academy, Commandant or Dr. Kas Bakkers. 
he was our lecturer in, in history. He wanted to get operational experience. And now remember, people like General Fayun and General Gelnes were his students. And as my duty, I had to censor the letters that come from Commandant Bacchus to General Mayor Fayun uh, and to General Janik Gelnes. And I had to censor these letters, but luckily there was no, wasn't a problem. They also came down and visited the course and they saw old, old, old Commandant Bacchus there, but it was so grand to have the old man there. He was a real trooper and he enjoyed that situation. He also wrote a book after that, uh, that period, uh, The Chronicles of a Bush Soldier. Uh, in the book, there's a few nasty things about me when I got cross and I used words that's not in the vocabulary. But in any case, that is what it is. Uh, it was very interesting having these people there. And uh, will you believe me, we, we had a lot of operational successes. Because in, in a platoon, there were older men. And I, if I take the age, it was uh, up to 50, nearly 60 years old. And you had younger men in their late 20s. And that combination of, of older men and younger men, you had the wisdom and you had the blood and guts of the younger guy was in one platoon. And, and, and they were honest uh, with the operation. They did what they had to do. They didn't, as we call it in the military, they didn't jump out. And, and they understood how to handle the local population. We, uh, nobody was, was killed or, or injured from our side. And we had a... a, a a lot of operational successes. After the one success, the guys uh, on the corpses, they found a lot of money. They handed the money to me and I handed to the then Brigadier Bishop, who was the officer commanding of Sector 20. He said to me, he doesn't know what to do with this money because the first time that the money got to him, <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> it got to me and uh, I didn't want to sit with his hot money. And he bought the guys a uh, a few drinks and the last night uh, when we were there uh, we utilized that in the form of beverages and so forth uh, that just interesting and uh, a lesson that i learned uh, a mix of old and young and the old guys were really fit they were fit they could keep the pace uh, in the environment and to me that was a, a very big experience you have all these people there, and I've still got friends, and from time to time, this group gets together. A lot of them died since, but uh, it's one of those things. Okay, uh, any questions about the first period as a major there, and the training that we did, uh, and uh, the experiences we had in Kimberley? I just want to make a statement that um, I might have done it on your channel as well, so on your, on your series. But as far as I know, Danny Tron was the first guy we used to work the name James Bond in history. And he was down in the Cape as a spy, working on the cover, and he used this the false name, fake name, James Bond. So I don't know where... Um, Jan Fleming got his name from, he says he got it from a bird, a very boring bird with the name of Bond. Probably not. Uh, there's a lot of things that's interesting. Can you just tell us the difference between a commando unit and a citizen force? Okay. Uh, can I just embroider on the uh, James Bond story? I also heard this. Uh, and remember, Jan Fleming uh, used to be a naval officer in naval intelligence. Uh, and the other attribute to, to Donny Tron was he was fluent in English. And that was uh, really not a strong point with the Boer forces. They could yes and no and, uh, and hello and goodbye. And some of them were fluent in English. But, but he had his uh, tertiary education in Cambridge. And this is how he could move between enemy lines with, with his proficiency in English. And he did what he did. He, he definitely did. And as I said to you, he went over to England. And you know, of course, I don't want to be nostalgic about this. Uh, in 1997, we went over to 
to Britain to join up with the SAS on a, on a visiting tour. They were here in South Africa. And I was fortunate there. And the commander, General Wells, he just got promoted. Uh, and he was officer commanding of their battle school, but he's uh, uh, the previous boss of the SAS. He took us to the plain fields of Salisbury, where Danny Tron did his reconnoitering. And I sat there and I wondered, what notes did this guy make? And here I am, so many years later, and here I'm sitting. And the next day we went to ports, uh, to the port. The same port that he was, Southampton. And I wondered in which little hill did he sit and watch how the Brits train their horses, getting them into ships, conditioning them. Uh, I, I really felt humbled to do this. Coming back to the difference between uh, permanent force, uh, you didn't ask that, but these are guys who are career soldiers. It's their career. The citizen force are... Uh, organized into various citizen force units and they support the counterinsurgency and the conventional war, depending on, on that, that unit. For instance, in Cape Town, you get your Cape Town Highlanders, you get Cape Town Rifles and all these units. Once a person is finished with his national service, he gets dealt into one of these citizen force units. And in these units, he does his three-month camps or three-week camps, or when there's a call-up, uh, a major call-up, that whole unit is called up, then, then they can uh, go with those units to the operational area. So that's the citizen force. The commando members are people who are locally in an area. Uh, like, for instance, uh, in Pretoria, let's, let's say Pretoria. Pretoria had quite a few... Uh, commandos. Some in the urban area, they had their demarcated areas, and they some were in, in the rural areas, they had their demarcated areas on the farms and on, on, on the plots that were outside of the city center. A better example is a, a small town like uh, Heilbronn. There's a commando at Heilbronn. They've got a commander, they've got a command structure, they've got companies, and they've got to protect the town of Heilbronn, just, just as by an example, or they have to look after the surrounding areas of, of Heilbronn. So commandos are localized. Citizen force can be called up for their task wherever the, task, uh, the government wants to send them. And the permanent force are the guys who are career soldiers. That's the difference between the three elements. Then you get the auxiliary service and you are placed on the national reserve, but those are just administrative uh, things. It's not active units and, 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 and so forth. Okay, so the commando in this sense of a word is not special forces. It's not like a commando unit. No, no, no. Of no other people. No. Okay. Uh, remember, how well were they, well were they equipped, sir? The citizen force people. The citizen people. force were, were very well equipped, equipment and, and so forth. And obviously, uh, if they had to, uh, say for instance, they were called up to the operational area. Uh, then at, at Grootfontein, they'll get all their kit that they need, what, whatever the, the case, case might be, vehicles and so forth. They travel to their operational area and they start doing this. The conventional guys will go to the battle school. They will get kitted out there and their equipment, tanks and these things are more, a little bit more difficult to get to the operational area. They can't, some of them they can put in aircraft, but it's normally by rail or by road on low beds. And they, they marry up with, with their main equipment, uh, big artillery pieces, tanks and these things. They marry up at Grootfontein or... Uh, other suitable place of assembly. This is this is how it works. But our logistical system was was very good. Uh, you know, when when our units went up uh, to the operational area in Uvambulan, for instance, uh, for South African Infantry Battalion, they were equipped, and we always use the phrase, from the little mustard spoon right up to the biggest weapon that you could get. The units stepped in and they 
signed for their equipment and they were gone. They were equipped and replenished and there they go. No uh, uh, log logistical guys, it was a well-oiled machine. Which so this is this is what happened. Which bring me to the question which I did discuss with you before, and uh, we, we do read all the comments you people make. And if it's a snotty comment, we just ban you. So don't even try that. And don't put links in without talking to me because YouTube, I understand, will uh, ban such a comment immediately. We'll put him on hold and then I have to go and look. So don't put a link in there on this. You know, I know what it is and where it's going to. Because certainly we found quite a few links and they're all banned now. Referring people to, um, they don't say naked ladies. And really, the show is not about that. Really, it's not about that. Oh, no. So one of the questions which I did find very interesting is, I was speaking at some stage, I don't know if it's with you, sir, or perhaps with Colonel Nick Mostert, uh, when Ernest Crooks older. And I said, I've heard about a plan of calling up 400,000 men as reserves in 1989, when there was a Cuban threat to come down south into Namibia. And the question is what I'm asking you now is, have we called up those people? And we did it, but let's say we did. 400,000 extra soldiers. Would we have been able to equip them, logistically speaking, and maintain them? Most definitely, Chris. Uh, look, uh, equipment and call up is linked to a threat. And obviously, you see this threat. I don't want to say long before the time, but the build up you can see. Uh, what happened in 89? Uh, and I think that's that's uh, to refer it right down to the to the mail. Was when Swapo uh, said they will adhere to uh, Resolution 435 to confine to their bases, and they didn't apply to that, and they came over in mass into Namibia, and we called up a lot of a lot of soldiers, but not for 400,000. Uh, I remember still some of my men at that side of the. At that stage, I was at Messina, and some of my uh, company commanders immediately went up. But logistically, uh, it would be possible to, to turn out 4,000 men at a certain space, provided there's a road, uh, road uh, with aircraft, obviously not all the Air Force, but chartered aircraft, which could, could, could be done. I think it would be nice to fly up to Grotenstein in a SAA Boeing, uh, aerostasis serving you and all these things. These things has happened. But uh, yes, it, it, it was possible. But at that stage in 89, we didn't call up so many because it was a two, three days and the situation was, was back to normal. Okay, now I might be um, going off course again a little bit here, yeah. but something occurred to me. We often hear that the Vietnam veterans say that it was a bit of a strange feeling for them to be in combat in an operational area in Vietnam. And the next moment they're out of it, they're on an aircraft, they're going back to the States, going home, and suddenly they're amongst their own people. And of course, the reverse. They get in an aircraft and they fly there and they land and suddenly they're in Vietnam, they're in theater. Now, right, my question to you, sir, would it be better not rather to have a troop train and get those people there, a lot of them in a troop train, but it takes a few days they can get into the, you know, the mode or to fly them in? <laughs> Which do you think is the best for the men? Uh, we we flew, flew most of them in, and obviously there was also a lot of train movement. But... Uh, the going in process, the going to war process was always positive because we had a training area in Oshivalu in the southern, most southern part of Uwambaland. That's just north of Tsumek. Where the troops got induction training. We trained them on the latest uh, intelligence picture, the local population. We acclimatized them and they practiced their drills. Uh, either conventional or counterinsurgency. They did patrols, ambushes, these things. 
And then uh, the uh, the main thing later years was we trained them in, in, in trench warfare, how to mop up the trenches. But the coming back, the demob, as we call it, demobilization, uh, I'm being honest with you, um, we did it quickly to get the guys, and they wanted to get home quickly. Obviously, after three months, you want to get home. But the psychological thing of, of getting guys who were in the thick of it, they had to undergo some or other psychological demobilization. There, I think we could have done better. I'm, I'm very, very honest with you, but time, space, money, and equipment, especially transport equipment, uh, was a problem getting guys because you know obviously the aircraft taking guys back home brings back a, another group of guys uh, to justify the, the turnaround time of, of aircraft and not trains yeah trains as well a full train up and a full train down uh, I mean it saves, saves a lot of money but the demobilization of guys going in into the operational area was always very good. Uh, was always good. The mobilization was good, but the demobilization, I think, it was too quick. And I'm not saying that they had to go through psychological evaluations, but just a day to to relax and and the guys with problems speak to a, a group of psychologists and uh, so forth. I think that there there we could have done much better. So I agree with the. Uh, the guys from Vietnam. It's, it's only human. It's only human. Can you tell us uh, what, what was the training like at the uh, Dolly Troll at the combat school? Uh, it was, first of all, uh, the, the theoretical part in, in lecturing. Uh, then the practical part that we could, could do there, especially the urban situation, we had uh, mock ups and so on, and we could do it there. And then the uh, uh, rural part was done at Smistra. And the course started there at Smistra. Obviously, they uh, reported at, at, at Donitron in, in Kimberley. We took them out and they were there for three weeks or six weeks or whatever the case might be. We trained them uh, in, in, in the very big uh, area of, of Smistra. We trained them there. And it was counterinsurgency training. Uh, you, you, you know what it is. It's patrolling. Uh, ambushes, attack on, on enemy bases, and so forth. And depending on, on which level the, the, the student was. But we had a very good training, training area. We didn't do uh, support weapons, uh, machine guns, mortars, and, and so forth. But some of the uh, more senior courses we took to Bloemfontein, where the paratroopers were. We showed them what's going on there, and we went to see the armor uh, and the Air Force and all, all this type of thing. Then we went to Potchers Room to see the artillery part. So we introduced them in, into those parts that, as a soldier, you must know what's a 5.5 five gun and uh, what, whatever the case might be. So that, that was very important, especially on, on, on the senior courses. But we tried to get the courses as practical as, uh, absolutely as practical as possible. Were the men quite keen? Yes, no, we didn't have problems. No, no, no. Remember, these are leader group. They were all gone through national service and they all wanted to be there. You didn't have the problems of conscientious objectives and things like that. In later years, and uh, when I get to my second part from 84 to 88, uh, we also trained uh, members of the Lesotho Defense Force, Swaziland Defense Force, and of course, uh, Transkai, Siskai, when they were still independent, we also trained them. They came on, on the forces there with us. And our people didn't have a problem with, with, with them. They were real good guys. So um, we had the international uh, situation as well, as well as our internal situation. So we covered the period now of 77 to 79, where you were like a, That's a major. Yeah. Major is like a field officer grade. Uh, what Sen did you be? Yeah. Yes. A, a senior officer. It's the lowest rank on the scene. Uh, okay. Sec 
second lieutenant, lieutenant, and a captain is junior officer, senior officers, field officers is when you start getting into the general ranks. That, that's a field officer, a 34 or a general officer. So when you were well on your way, and um, what would you command there? Would you just be in training or? Just training. I, I, I was uh, the senior uh, instructor at the counterinsurgency training wing, and I specialized in, in the senior courses, more the senior courses. Then you had, uh, but uh, we had a, a very good group of instructors, and each course had a a course commander, and he had his instructors and a warrant officers, NCOs, and we carried on like that. Just before we go to 84, 88, so I, I know that Mr. Mandela once was in trouble with some people because he arrived at the Dani Trom uh, service or something. There was something happening, and he spoke very highly of, of, of Dani Trom, and some people were actually a bit upset about it. Do you know how Donny Tron died? Because yes, I think he well. died as a young man. He died as a young man. He was not even married. He was uh, engaged to a young girl called Donny. And um, he was busy hampering the uh, advance of the Brits from Potchestrum to Johannesburg. Remember, they, they wanted to capture Johannesburg. And um, he hampered them all the way. You know, uh, these marching columns, most of them were on foot. He hampered them. And uh, he got on horseback and drove away. They couldn't do anything. They had to deploy. And, and, and they were really uh, frustrated with, with a man. And near the Hatsrand area, it's between uh, Potschstrom and Taltonville. They retaliated and fired with POMZ uh, guns, and he was shot. He was, he was killed by POMZ. He died there. Today, there's a monument. And on top of the monument is a very strange uh, figure. And many people, uh, they, they speak, it looks like a splitted banana or this, but it's the trigger mechanism of a Martini Henry rifle, which he liked very much. It's the, the trigger mechanism of, of the rifle Danitron liked very much. He was buried near Ikonov and later reburied again. And he was buried next to his fiancée, Hani, because she died of pneumonia uh, during the war. Now, uh, President Mandela uh, always liked to refer to Danitron and, and, and he used to like the works of General De Wet and poems written about General De Wet. He used to quote that quite a lot. But he was a well-read man. I think he, and I'm going to make a joke now, in, in the jail, I think he had enough time to read up all these things uh, for, 20, <laughs> for 27 years. But, but he was, uh, he knew the, the history of the Boer forces. He knew very well. More than our own people know it. Then he's still near the old history, so may, may I say the accurate history. Absolutely what, accurate. What, yeah, what's no. written today, sadly enough. Yeah, no, 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 precisely. Yeah, he struck me as that. He certainly knew about the senior von Rensburg as well, as one senior. Um, yes, he, he, he knew about scene. that. Sorry, I didn't catch the last. No, uh, he knew about that. He most, I, I know that. Yes, he certainly did. He certainly did. Okay, so now, so we go to 84 and 88. By this time, you could not have been a major anymore. No, I started as a lieutenant colonel, and then very soon after that, was promoted to a, a full colonel as officer commanding of this Danny Drone Combat School. It was quite nice to go back, as I always say, to old hunting grounds. Most of our supporting staff were the same. The training staff uh, was a new bunch. I had a lot of guys, X-32 battalion guys there, which were very helpful uh, in the practical war and this type of thing. And uh, we started over the bank. Uh, our courses became bigger. And remember now in 84, 
we had a very big urban urban problem uh, in South Africa with the riots, 84, 85. <clears throat> in this period, I was also chosen to be um, in a committee of the police, railway police and Air Force and some uh, state members working for the, the state, especially in uh, administration, um, to go to areas where there's a lot of riots and to look especially at the tactical deployment of the riot makers. I gained a tremendous amount of uh, information and I learned a lot of lessons there, which we proud back in, in training. It was in this period that a, a group of 10,000 attacked us one day in a Casper with a police con contingent. We were eight people in the Casper. And with a new tear gas that we developed, we dispersed them. Nobody was shot or killed or arrested or anything, and they lived peacefully. Uh, that was very interesting in, in, uh, to see that side of the, of the war. We visited the Eastern Province quite a lot, uh, Port Elizabeth and surrounding areas. Uh, and I learned a lot of uh, lessons there. We employed it, uh, these lessons in, in the training area and even in our handbooks that we wrote at that stage for counterinsurgency for the army. And out of this came also the legal aspects that our soldiers had to adhere to. Look, we couldn't rewrite the law, but as a doctor, we could have our own legal aspects. And if a soldier deviates from the legal aspects, then there was a problem. But he, when he stuck to the legal aspects, for instance, uh, in a riotous assembly, you don't start shooting first. You first talk, tear gas, and then, then, then shooting, and what, whatever the case might be. The whole thing was to defuse the situation. And this is what we learned our soldiers. And remember, we're not policemen. Uh, we're not trained as policemen. Uh, is to defuse a confrontation instead of firing. Well, there were instances when we had to fire. When you, when your wall uh, back is against the wall, like at Maricana, you've got no option. They can say about Maricana what they want, but those people, the mob was chasing them. The, the policeman. I don't want to go into that, that detail. I didn't do the study, but what I saw on television, uh, and I don't know what was the preamble to that uh, situation, but it was a very, very, very difficult uh, situation there. Uh, we did a, a, a lot of uh, <clears throat> training periods uh, with the army and people came to us. That's now outside of the curriculum. And uh, we trained them as well in the, especially the urban uh, situation that was confronting us in, in South Africa. This was the time when we trained Swaziland, uh, the whole Lesotho Defense Force, and so forth. We got quite a lot of visitors from overseas coming to us, and uh, a lot of state departments also came to us, and it was a uh, very good time that, that gave us and prepared us for the task uh, ahead. Then we found that the commando officer commandings, and remember there's a, a threat on farms, farm murders, belt fires, and all these things. They couldn't leave their own states and their units. And we then went and got the authorization to start with uh, a short period of training where he, we give him the handbooks and he goes back home and via teletution uh, distance training we train the guy, we give him certain assignments and he's got to post it back to us those days they were not computers, it was all by the post office but we, we managed we then went to his headquarters he presented his appreciation and he was marked on that whether he passed the exam or not instead of taking an uh, imaginary area and try to get lessons out of that 
Then we helped him where we could because, you know, he knows his area. He's from that area. And we also got in people from the local command. So for instance, in Dumontain, this was now in uh, Reddersburg. Just, just, just as an example, the command always sent a, a person from, from the headquarters to come and help us in this situation. And we really had these guys uh, up to scratch with their appreciations and what they could do with their capabilities and abilities where they needed equipment, uh, etc. And uh, in this course, uh, I really learned our country. Uh, I traveled quite extensively and I met the most wonderful people, the cream of our people. And this was a, a eye opener. And I tra think we trained 80% more uh, commando officer commandings than with the normal uh, formal courses that we had at the units. And uh, <laughs> one thing led to another. One of the units was in Louis Trichard. And uh, after two months, I was made officer commanding of that area where Louis Trichard was one of my units. So I, I trained my own people. So if it was bad, it was my own bad luck. But this, this was very informative to me as a soldier to, to see the country, uh, the, the urban situation as well as the rural situation. We had our problems. We, we got to the one guy and uh, he had done no preparation. And uh, I'm too busy today to see you. We traveled all the way from Kimberley to, to, to Cape Town. Uh, that guy was taken off the the command cadre of that uh, of that command, uh, but you know these things these things happen. But that was a one for the rest. of The people were always kind to us, and we were there to help. Uh, yeah, this 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 was really a a, a great situation, and uh, I was very happy to to end my career at the combat school on that note. I left the combat school now for Messina as officer commanding of the Sotmansberg military area. And uh, I learned a lot of lessons there that I could um, apply in Messina. And boy, did I get come down to the ground because it was a, a new ball game as well. Uh, one thinks you've got all the theoretical things and all the courses behind you. But... Uh, Real life happens, but it was great. Of course, that, that about Dani Tron Combat School, it doesn't exist anymore. The name is carried over to the intelligence uh, school in Potchestro. And again, the function went over to the infantry school. They are doing this function now as we, as we speak today. So uh, for the second time, uh, the function was taken <laughs> under me to infantry school, I was there then, and then again it happened. Happened, to me. but this happens. They call it rationalization, and it's for the e economical situation, for budgetary uh, situations, and to concentrate excellence at one place and not disperse excellence. So uh, that meant for the good, and that is now the Donington Combat School. It was a, a very great time in my in my career. My kids also enjoyed it there. Uh, and as I said, the people of Kimberley, uh, they were absolutely super uh, towards and, 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 and their attitude towards the soldier and the defense force was very, very positive. I must ask you, sir, before we leave this episode, why did the army deploy internally? Is that not a police function? Of course, yes, it's a police function. And, and, and remember, we are soldiers. Our weaponry is a rifle. We equip the guys with, with tear smoke and with smoke grenades. But we never had, excuse my friend, shambox and batons and this, this type of thing. We, we, we never use that. And uh, within those limitations, we had to operate. That's why the legal aspects were so, so, so important. And it had to be drilled down to the, to the lowest situation. 
Now, I said we are not policemen. Policemen are trained in riot control and this, this type of thing. Okay, we trained our troops in this situation with the help of the police and within the law. Remember one thing we must always remember. It must be within the law. But in 84, 88, and certain, certain times afterwards, uh, the riots were so widespread that there was a manpower problem. And the police uh, needed us uh, to cover certain areas where they couldn't. I mean, the numbers was against them. And that is the main reason. Uh, our biggest problem was, was in the Johannesburg area where they complained about the, the deployment of 3-2 battalion. But the fact of the matter was, there were MK guys there storming and attacking the troops, and they retaliated with rifles. And again, our weapons are the R1 and R4. And that is a problem. If you look at the situation in China, uh, when the riots were there at Dian Ning Plain. They uh, attacked those rioters with army tanks, not just rifles. And it was the end of that, that mob. Uh, I don't think it, 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 it must happen. And in my background, I am still the that troops and the army should not be used internally. Our latest situation with riots and Natal and, and all these problems, we had to use the defense force. And especially with COVID, we did police functions to see the guy wears his mask. Uh, they don't break the curfew and they adhere to the situation. Uh, but it, it was difficult for, for the troops to adapt to that situation. That was perhaps easier than to try and curb uh, riotous assemblies and mobs doing things. Uh, one must never uh, use your army against the civilians. I think that's the golden rule. But politics and the situation demand a different situation. That's why we trained our troops. We knew this is going to come and it could come and it came. Luckily, we were, we were prepared. And uh, as I said, and this is more in test, uh, we don't have butt buttons and, and shambox and this type of thing. And that's why we were involved in, in, in the tear gas situation. Because tear gas, uh, especially small babies and people with asthma, they, uh, uh, they could die. And, and that's the, the last thing that we, we wanted. And if you open fire with a platoon of troops, there's going to be a lot of bodies. I mean, look at Chapel. That was police, and I'm not uh, saying this to the de detriment of the police at that stage. Uh, that was long ago. But uh, that's not good for our history to see this type of thing. But sometimes these mobsters, <laughs> They, uh, they carry on and they carry on and they tease you and they lure you into, into situations. Uh, it's, it's a very difficult one. But uh, my, in my book, uh, soldiers should be in the supporting role during internal situations and not on the front to try and uh, curb big mobs and so on. The police must be trained, trained to do that. I worked with a few um, army units in Pakosa, which I believe is there in Johannesburg area, during the very worst of the riots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's very. And I can tell you, sir, I was very impressed with the army in the sense that they were very keen to know. <laughs> the, the lieutenant, the platoon commander, and his platoon sergeant will arrive and they will talk to you very keen, very asking, very pointed questions. They were really not there just to start shooting. Um, so may I make a statement, sir? May I ask you directly? I'm not making a statement, I'm asking you. Would you say, 
that the South African army, when deployed in the townships internally in South Africa, dealing with the riots, the other side of the war, were they constrained? Yes or no? The only constraint was, was the law and uh, when to shoot, the rules of engagement. That was the only restraint uh, that, that, that was there. Luckily, uh, apart from the uh, uh, Patlong situation, uh, I can't recall serious uh, problems with the Defence Force. Uh, and luckily, we, we were not deployed for very long, long periods. This is what happens. I remember the, the guys, especially in squatter camp, and you know, because that's a very difficult one to go from a policing point and a military point, uh, then shots are fired onto a section. And within 10 seconds, the section commanders lost control of his platoon because they are amongst all these shacks. There's not a, a road or a, or a beacon or anything. And uh, this is when problems can start. It's, it's, it's very difficult. Shanty towns. And I've seen this in, in, in Brazil as well, with the favelas where all the people, and, and we don't have a squatter problem. If you compare the situation in, in, in Brazil with the favelas, and, and they had the same problem. If you go in there, uh, it's a problem. And I had the same problem with the French. There are certain no areas uh, around Paris that nobody goes in there because it's a squatter house on squatter house on squatter house, and they rain that area. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not unique to South Africa. Uh, I think it's a more African problem, but uh, I mean, Brazil is not in Africa. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a world problem, but it is a very difficult situation to, to handle if you, you get confrontation. And the problem they had in Brazil with this is special forces guys were near by the drug lords and say, listen, what do you, the army pay you? Okay, I'll give you 10 times more. Become a bodyguard. I've seen this in Colombia, that there are squatter camps only for, for bodyguards for Mr. Escobar uh, in, in the Brazilian situation. So I've, I've, I've seen these things uh, all over the world. I've seen it. Uh, we're not in a unique situation, but uh, it's, it's, it's a problem. It's a really well, problem. That's what happens when the police loses control, because that place in yeah. Paris, the, the, the suburb, I know what you're talking about, I believe is where 90% of all the Islamic terrorists come from. The guys That's who go correct. over to, you know, to join a terrorist movement, and they all come from that area. And it all goes back to social um, factors as well. So and, and that is a failure of politicians, so that is not a failure of the military or the police, because it's an impossible situation. It's a political situation, because, uh, uh, can I speak on the French situation? Yes, and of please, course. I like the French, I like the French people very much, and I like the French, and I've still got friends there, we, we contact each other from time to time. But the problem, the political problem there was that all the colonies in Africa were regarded as French citizens. When they got into France, they were given money on a socialism situation, free miracle. If the man had 14 wives, they were all welcome with the children and now come to education. And it was the teachers in France who started with this situation. And now the schools have got to be protected by soldiers because the pupils attack the, the teachers. We think we've got an unique situation. We don't have. And as I said, uh, from Napoleon on, I've got a, a very great uh, uh, respect and admiration for the French people. But this, as you correctly said, it's a political problem. It's not the soldiers' problem. Now the soldiers have got to... Uh, get into it and, and try to solve the situation or the police. Uh, 
it's a political problem. And that's the breeding ground of prob problem areas is in those townships around Paris. I must tell all of you here that uh, the general was speaking to my wife in French just now. He cut it out, but I could understand most of it. Um, we have a really uh, great admiration for France. In fact, as George M. James fellow will tell you that uh, where the French operates, they normally don't ask for permission from the UN or anything. They just go and do the job. They, they just come in. And so they never betrayed uh, because they keep everything inside themselves. And then that's a good, that's a good military. But it seems to me, sir, that I have to be careful now I say this, but I sometimes felt that the police and the army, by which I mean the SADF, were abused. Uh, were asked to do certain things internally, which were really not something which we could solve or resolve, and especially not over a gun barrel. But that, of course, is a... <laughs> But I see you wish to answer something, so I'm listening. First, I, I, I fully agree here. And again, it's a political problem. It's a political problem. Uh, uh, look at, at the riotous pro uh, problems we had in 84, 85. It was the beginning of the ANC. We had the armed conflict on our borders. And they started internally because they saw uh, coming in from our, our borders, they, they, they cannot uh, get us to uh, a conference table. And then they started with internal riots. This thing is happening now. There's a mob, uh, in, especially in Natal and in Johannesburg, uh, to get their political aims and strategy in place this is the type of thing they do. And who must go in? The police and the soldiers. Instead of, uh, and, and I'm talking openly now, they can crucify me for this. Instead of the ANC solving their internal problems, the police and the defense force must now go and solve these problems. And, and uh, the same applied in France, the same applied in Spain, the same applied in Brazil that I, that I saw. It's a political problem getting out of hand. And now, okay, the army and the Air Force and the police must go in and they must do the thing. Von uh, Clausewitz said, war is an extension of politics, but that's in the, in the classical sense. If you don't like a country or we want to attack that country or want to invade that country, my political situation says I must do it. But it's a political thing. And Soldiers and policemen are the pawns of the politician. No, I 100% I agree with your, with your stance in this situation. Yes, thank you, sir, because the problem is you don't really resolve anything. The army and the police can, you know, put a band-aid over it. They can suppress it. They can keep the situation in control. But some states down the line, you need, you need to treat the cause. Precisely. In our present situation, the ANC must sort out the factioning uh, and fragmentation in the ANC, and then we will have, have peace again in South Africa. Well, we better do it or there's going to be a civil war. I mean, it was coming close to that, uh, according to Dr. Um, Stienkamp, which on the other video which we had, Dr. Stienkamp, the ambassador, the former National Intelligence Service boy, uh, senior, senior man. And he straightforward said that was an attempt of, of uh, insurrection and it could have led to a civil war. And everybody was extremely angry with the army. Uh, well, a lot of people, let me not generalize, but a lot of people were very angry with the army. And he pointed out that they went and they took care of a strategic places first, the water, the electricity, those things, and then they started moving in. And there's no doubt that the police lost complete control of the, of, of the situation. It is very sad. It, it had major repercussions, even here in Switzerland. No, ab absolutely. Ab ab absolutely. No, uh, yeah, well, 
previously I said I don't like uh, politicians. Can you see why? <laughs> yeah, that's true, sir. So we know why. So let us rather not talk about that. Is there anything I missed about the Donny Trom uh, combat school? No, I, I think I think we've we've covered everything. And um, that that it was great people that we worked with there. Really, we it was great people that we worked with. Okay, thank you, Vince. And I think what we will do is we'll end this episode. And I say to everybody here listening, watching this, making your comments, thank you very much. If you have direct questions for the general, just address them to us or leave them below. We do go through them. If possible, we will answer. Uh, but just be patient. There's really a lot of you out there. And uh, thank you very much again. Thank you, sir, for your time. And thank until, you, Chris. It was very nice. Until we meet again, God bless. Thank you. Same to you.